In this one-hour Bondi Vet special, Dr Chris Brown travels to South Africa for a working holiday that will realise a lifelong ambition. This has absolutely been a boyhood dream to not only see the animals but make differences to their lives. As a vet, it's, it's the holy grail. In an extraordinary adventure, he will meet the ultimate lion whisperer. What I find even more amazing than the fact they don't tear him apart is the fact they actually go so far the other way. They love him. Perform operations on two big cats. This surgery is going to be incredibly difficult. Join in the battle to protect the endangered rhino from poachers. It's a, it's a one on war. Make friends with mesmerising animals and feel the true spirit of South Africa. <laughs> it's only three weeks now before Chris leaves on his long-awaited trip to South Africa. Got an appointment with Dr Wing. He'll be handling some of the world's most dangerous animals, but that's not what he's afraid of. It's a little bit embarrassing when you're six foot five and weigh 100 kilos and you don't like needles. Chris, do you want to come on through? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Now, because of the kind of work you're going to be doing, we do need to update everything. How many injections are we talking about? Today, we're looking at four injections. Four? Yeah. With every mention of each shot, I just started to feel more and more faint as it went on. Now I know how the dogs feel when they come in and see me. All right, Chris, we've got all the vaccines here. OK, mm -hmm. there, these are the four that I was telling you about. That's good. I lured in here under the misapprehension that this was a vaccination, singular. I have no control over it. You can't fake this. You just start to get hot. The colour starts to drain away from what you can see and everything starts to sort of go a bit grey. Mm-hmm. And that's when you um, feel like you're about to clock off. Oh, I'm going to prep you this time with a bit of chocolate. Chocolate's always helpful. So just lying down. Good on you. This is just demeaning. <laughs> yeah, it's quite funny though when a big, big guy with big muscles, you know, kind of falls down and um, needs a bit of extra help. Professionally, Angela, you're probably finding it hilarious. But <laughs> it's not funny for me. Africa, it's always been at the very top of my bucket list, but this trip is about more than sightseeing. I've been invited by some of the most amazing animal conservationists in Africa to spend some time over there, but also get hands on with some of the most incredible animals on the planet. But, true to form, plane leaves in two hours. I'm running late, so I better get going. After flying into Johannesburg, Chris's journey begins with a 100 kilometre drive to the Kingdom of the White Lion, a unique 2,000 acre conservation reserve. Just take a look at this. I reckon I'm about as far from Bondi as I could possibly be. I am about to go and meet a guy who absolutely intrigues me. His name's Kevin. He's known around these parts as the Lion Whisperer. He gets up and close personal to lions, but he wants me to get even closer, to operate on two of his lions. Now, for me, that is so far out of my comfort zone. It's still cats, right? Just big, aggressive cats. It's just it's like he's walking a dog. The Kingdom of the White Lion is the vision of Kevin Richardson. Twelve years ago, he fell in love with two cubs born in captivity. Now he provides a safe home for 41 lions, many of which he's bred and hand raised. There's your my girl. There's your my boy. You find it all right? I did. Good. You're up your heart oh, to miss, mate. Oh, Not everyone did. does that. Yeah. 
Well, meet Simon's pride. This is Simon. Hey, Simon. He's the, the chief in charge, really. So he's the one that eats combis. <laughs> Hence the. <laughs> Come on, away from there. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Nicely. Good boy. Oh. He's a good boy. Yeah, the closest you've been to an adult. Swing <laughs> looks at me, and there's, there's actually no why between me. And yeah, that. no, it's a different feeling. Yeah, eh? it's a big window. And it's a big window, yeah. His head's. Yeah. It just goes against everything your mind wants to believe it's seeing because people shouldn't walk with lines, wild lines. It just doesn't really make any sense when you see it. So for me, it, it just it blows my mind. Look at my face. Nice look. Not great. While Kevin dreams of no lion living in captivity, the reality is the wild population is rapidly diminishing. Hey. Oh. Oh. My goodness, it's 40 degrees. Do you have to lie on top of me? These definitely haven't lived the lives of a captive, you know, normal zoo kind of lion. They've, they've gotten to uh, be in the bigger areas, live in prides, fight for females, you know, roar at other lions over territories. So they live as natural life as I could give them in captivity. You know, so I'm in Australia, people go to zoos and look at the animals in cages. Here, it's, it's sort of the other way around, isn't it? People are in cages here. Not bad, baby. Baby. You are a terror. You are a terror. No. <gasps> ah! I've always thought, you know, if you gain the trust of an animal and get to know it on an individual basis, then the sky's the limit. Once you form the a really good relationship. There's no reason why when that lion gets to two, three, four, five, there's no reason why he should actually change his attitude towards you. What do you think when they see you in there? What do you reckon is going through their mind? These lions, they definitely know that I'm not a lion. So I'm almost like this honorary member of this pride. What I find even more amazing than the fact they don't tear him apart is the fact they actually go so far the other way. They love him. They're all over him. They just want to be near him and, and be scratched by him and, and roll around with him. It's real affection. What can I do? I can't. <laughs> Thank you. Is that, a, is that what you call a lion hug? <laughs> Feels I'm interrupting. I'm interrupting the love affair. Chris is about to become a lot more than an observer. There's been an outbreak of facial tumours in the Pride and Kevin has asked the Aussie vet to help out. We've had a recent spate of uh, uh, what, what's referred to as a sarcoid papilloma. They develop quite rapidly um, and they also seem to be quite contagious. Chris will be operating on two lines, Kevin's favourite Napoleon and the aggressive Maisha. That's got to be awkward for her, eating and, and yeah. you know, socialising with that. Yeah, the only trick is, is she's not a, a hand-reared lion. <laughs> she's more of a wildish lioness that's grown up in this pride. Yeah. Um, so yeah, she'll take our hands off if, you, if even if I try and you know probe around on her lap. You look at Napoleon on his nose there. You see his nose? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. That's the one I'm worried about as well. If there's any concern that he's not going to get his nose back together properly or it's going to be tricky, he, he is my baby, so daddy's got to intervene here and <laughs> make sure what's best for baby. If there wasn't enough pressure about working on a line, he's not just a line. He's the very reason Kevin does what he does, so it's um, a lot of expectation. times as I hear it, I never ever get sick of it. You cannot get sick of a lion roaring. It's absolutely incredible. For me, the sightseeing part of this journey out to see Kevin is all of a sudden gone. Now it comes down to work. Kevin really should be very well aware of the fact I've never operated on lions before. Now it's my time to impress. I hope I can. <laughs> Maisha and Napoleon need to be isolated in the shed so Chris can sedate them. Winner takes all. When they walk past, 
I put a hide behind a brick wall so they don't see me. And jab. When I jab in there, the needle stays where it is and this pushes in an injector. Can I be honest with you? It's not a technique I've used before. Not a technique I've had to use before, but we're um spirit of adventure, we're gonna give it a go. Open rod. Yeah, mate. Kevin is well aware of the risks involved. We've had a vet that was chomped because the lion tower wasn't sedated properly. That was a lesson learned. I should have mentioned that earlier on, hey, <laughs> before you came all this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The surgeries are tricky. They're in a delicate part of the body that bleeds a lot. Close! But Close. what really freaks me out is the anaesthetic. At the Kingdom of the White Lion, just outside Johannesburg, Chris is attempting to sedate a wild lioness so he can begin surgery. After several nervous attempts, Better? Yeah, good one. finally, success. First job, okay. Let's go out to Never. Yeah, it's um, bending a bit quicker now, but um, I'm very happy to see an empty syringe there. Roll her into this? Yeah. Can you just tap her eye for me? The big test of whether Maisha was actually asleep was tapping her eyes. You normally just need one tap, but I think I was working on about 10 or 20, just to be sure. But 10 minutes later, Maisha is still not completely under. She's just a little bit light. She's, she's actually blinking when we tap her eye, so it's not really the, the state you want when I'm about to actually cut into her. <laughs> What Chris doesn't know is that during the last operation here, a lion woke up and took a bite out of the attending vet's arm. I've seen things go wrong. You know, there's a lot of adrenaline in the air and everyone's hyped up and, and then, you know, you get a little bit anxious always when a cat goes under the knife. But I'm sure she's in capable hands. I'm, I'm assured, at least. There was a, there was a pause there. <laughs> I heard a pause. <laughs> Now I've done my research. I, go okay. I googled you. <laughs> really? Yeah. Got about 20 minutes or so. If that. It's conservative. Alright. Let's go. It's gonna be a cut, like a wedge, almost like a triangle to try to get in through this gum here. I'm doing Maisha first for a couple of reasons. First of all, her tumour is a bit more obvious. It should be a bit easier to get out. So, in a way, it's a bit of a warm-up to the main game, to Napoleon. I'm trying to get a good margin around the base of it and just avoid the, the fact that incisors is about an inch away from my hand. To Chris's relief, there are no complications during the surgery. Hmm. OK, can we just get a check on this eye again? Good. The reason I ask you about that is about your hands very clear. <laughs> your hands are very close to her jaws. With the tumour removed, he just needs to stitch the wound. What kind of knot do you call that? That one is called a simple knot. <laughs> <laughs> Named after the surgeon that's uh, performing on it. <laughs> that devised it. <laughs> Kevin is keeping a close eye on Chris's handiwork. It's going to make it look, look pretty, you know, because uh, she's got to find herself a guy one of these days and. No, no one wants to go out with a girl that look, looks like that. I'm actually really happy that that's actually come out really nicely and that the, the lips actually come back together quite cleanly and from here that, that swelling will actually subside and, and the great thing about this area is it has such a great blood supply. It heals really quickly. Oh, there we go. Do that. Wonderful. All right, this wakes her up. <laughs> Most obliging. Get the hell out of here. That was really frantic. I, actually, a couple of times I had to try to distract the guys and just sit with my gear, fumbling for syringes, just so my hands would stop shaking. There's a huge difference between Maisha and Napoleon, not just their size, but most importantly for me, it's their age. Maisha's three, Napoleon's 13. 
And with that comes a whole new range of risks with the anaesthetic. You just have to be so careful because at that age, you could lose him. Much easier, huh? Yeah, good. The difference between a tame cat and a wild cat. You can tell me one more time. Yeah, well, I'm going to just tell you one more time that this isn't just a lion. This is like a brother. So you, you are aware of that too. So. I know. I know. No, look, he's, he's a special cat. Huh? Each one of those scars represents something. I'm going to have one across here, am I, <laughs> if things go bad? <laughs> yeah. Slowly, Napoleon is succumbing to the anaesthetic under Chris's watchful eye. Not only does this line mean so much to Kevin, this surgery is going to be incredibly difficult. We're dealing with an area that's not only very sensitive, but there's no give, there's no spare skin to enable me to cut the tumour out and then bring the skin back together and stitch it in place. Here is a real challenge. And then there's a clock on me. Anyone that's had a, a punch in the nose or even a nosebleed knows that the the nose has a lot of blood. One little cut to the nose and, and they'll bleed and they'll continue to bleed. And this isn't just one little cut, this is a huge gash that we're having to make here. And get quite deep in and around this, this mass. The large amount of blood flowing into the wound is making the surgery difficult. OK, so there it is there. The real challenge here is actually closing this wound here because you can see it's, it's big. It's about a centimetre and a half wide and about two centimetres long. And in an area like the nose, that doesn't come together that easily or, or quickly. I just can't understand how you're going to do it. Over to you, Chris. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> but even Kevin is happy with the final result. Seriously impressive. Not done yet. No, it's looking really good. <laughs> Don't be so modest. <laughs> when you sign that line, you commit to becoming a vet and going to vet school, you, you don't ever for a second think that you're going to be in a place like Africa operating on a big male lion like Napoleon. It's awesome. It's just not what you ever, ever planned for. But you're so happy it happened. So well done. Good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's my stress meter. Yeah, I know, I swear that's, yeah. that's, that's yes. registering higher. So right is this is like nine out of ten stress meter. Yeah, sure. Okay. Good job. Good job. <laughs> that's um. That was intense. It's just full on. I mean, awkward position, and I'm on my knees, lying down, and all the while is just that big head staring right at you and he's anaesthetised, but those eyes look straight through you. So I know. Now the surgeries have been successfully completed, Chris has told the story about what happened to the last vet who came to the kingdom. You serious? A vet actually came here and got, got chomped on. Really? It's good, isn't it? That would have been in the, um, the column marked essential knowledge, but um, he didn't pass that on. Thank you. After the anaesthetic wears off, Maisha is demanding to be let out. That's a good boy. <gasps> but Napoleon needs a lot more TLC. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but it's for your own good. Yeah? Yeah, it's actually looking very good. I mean, he's very sore. You can see he's feeling very sorry for himself. But he's a, he's a tough cat, eh? You've had worse than that in your life, my boy. It's time for Chris to head back to Johannesburg. But before he says goodbye, Kevin introduces him to some miniature Napoleons. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, you're scary, aren't you? Yeah, I bet you. For you, is this where the relationship starts? Yeah, absolutely. If you're going to form a relationship with a lion, it, it, it really should start at this age. Even at this age, it's about enrichment. In captivity, you've got to, you know, tire or just keep them occupied all the time. Stimulate those little young minds. I am at my happiest when I'm with the lions because it is a way of me finding a sanctuary. 
<laughs> I've often said, and I really truly believe this, I would give it up like that to see wild numbers increase exponentially. If, if you know, if they could just, if somebody could say, this is the magic, you know, um, formula, you've got to stop going in with lines, and then overnight line numbers will increase, I'd do it like that in a heartbeat. Oh, yes. As far as days as a vet go, I haven't ever had one where I've done surgeries on lions in Africa. So I reckon I remember this one. I'm in Johannesburg and what a city. It's just a city of contrast, the heights of affluence. And then you look around, you just see the depths of poverty. And right now I'm heading to the outskirts with the SPCA and I reckon I'm in for a surprise. Chris has joined up with SPCA vet Leon Malherky. They're heading to the community of Fintown to provide much needed free vet care. The problem that people have in this, you know, remote areas is such they don't have transport and they have a lot of animals. So, as I say, if they can't get to us, we've got to get to them. What I can't believe is that 20 minutes ago we are in the centre of Johannesburg, a thriving economic centre, and then we come here. They're worlds away from each other. Word yeah. get, gets around when you've arrived? Yeah. 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 The people will start coming. It's not long before the locals are surrounding the mobile clinic. It's people just coming from anywhere and everywhere. It's loud, it's noisy, it, it, there's just animals appearing. I just hope we can handle them all. The vets provide basic health checks and desexing clinics. But today, the focus is on providing the all-important vaccinations for the killer disease, rabies. That one dog bite him here. Oh, okay. Yeah. The blood was coming from the mouth. From the mouth? Yeah. If your dog gets rabies, he's going to bite the people, you're going to die as well. There we go. You're a very good boy, aren't you? It's lack of money, not lack of love, that's threatening most of these animals including flamboyant Mary's reluctant buccaneer. How long have you had him for? Yeah. Uh, three, four months. He's at least six months. Six months. He's got all his teeth. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's got fleas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the other one is big and is brown. Yeah. See here? Is this what you mean? There's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's ticks. Yeah. Yeah, so it gets ticks as well. <laughs> What about those? What's wrong with him? Maybe we think about getting him desexed, so he, he stays at home more and stops fighting. You want to kill it? No, 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 no. There is a love for dogs here. You look at Mary and the way when she talks about Buccaneer, a big smile comes across her face. You just need to give them the means to look after their animals and they'll do it. There you go. He didn't even jump. He's a tough boy. Mm. Yeah. You, you love your dogs, huh? Too much, I tell you. <laughs> you love it too much. <laughs> See you, Buccaneer. You're a good boy, aren't you? You've got a good one here. Go, go. Follow the hat. Follow the hat. Come on. <laughs> Buccaneer is what the SPCA's program out here is, is all about. He's got problems but they're really easily fixed. And if you can just do a few things like vaccinations against rabies and sterilising, then Buccaneer could live a really long and, and quite happy life. With Mary a satisfied customer, it's off to the local primary school to talk to the students about looking after their pets. Part of the SPCA's work here is all about education and it really starts here with the kids because they're the ones that go home and spread the word to the rest of the family. The education today is coming from the esteemed teacher known as... Yep. So in Australia, what I do is I look after animals. So I'm like a, a doctor for animals. And so today, we talk to you about making the animals happy and healthy and jumping like kangaroo. If you have a dog 
at home, I want you to woof. If you have a cat at home, I want you to meow. If you have something else at home, make that noise, okay? okay. In three, two, one, go. <laughs> I can see you're going to be very good to your animals. Yeah. And thank you for having me in Fine Town. Thank you. Just for a moment, the spirit of Africa just infused into my body, and a moment later, it was gone. And it was me on that dance floor. <laughs> this seems like a lot of fun, just running around, dancing, playing games, but the message here is associating animals with care and with love. And that's what the SPCA is doing out here. It's a hell of a way to get a message across, and it works. I'll see you later. Right now I'm heading to a place called Mohololo, which is a very special wildlife rescue and rehabilitation centre. They'll take anything from lions that are hit by cars to leopards that are caught in traps, you name it, they'll treat it. And right now I'm off to actually microchip a rhino, which I think is going to be easier said than done. After helping out the SPCA, Chris is back on the road. His next destination, the Mohololo Rehabilitation Centre, is located in Limpopo, 550 kilometres northeast of Johannesburg. But as Chris gets closer, there's an unscheduled pit stop in a local village. Hello. People say one of the great things about Africa isn't so much what you see in the tour guide, it's these moments where you just come across these little magical situations. This man is very tall, my God. This man is very tall. Yes, thank you. I think they were probably as amazed as I was when they saw me. Big six foot five Australian bloke. I don't see them every day. Well, 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 I gotta meet a long, tall guy like you from Australia. No wonder you're good cricketers and rugby players, eh? Tall so, and strong. So Look at me, I'm the animals, small. Huh? <laughs> you're right. Welcome, welcome. Wildlife warrior Brian Jones set up Maholo Holo as an animal refuge back in 1992. There are a lot of challenges for the animals in Africa. They're getting poached, they're getting poisoned, they're running out of habitat. Where do they go when things get tough? Thankfully. There's my holo holo. Hmm? And the keys. And the keys. I promise you I don't. <laughs> Most vet hospitals back home have a clinic dog or a clinic cat. <laughs> <laughs> At my holo holo, they have a clinic baby black rhino. They um, sign on the door for a reason, I think. As a calf, Landella was rescued from the wild after her mother abandoned her when the baby became stuck in a mud pit. So you look after her pretty much 24 hours a day. Yeah. When you leave her to go to the bathroom or to go get her milk or something, she'll just scream and cry until you come back. Since being rescued, minders like David give Landella round-the-clock care. Come on, come on! Including games of Chasey to keep her interested. Be careful, she's gonna bite you, she's gonna bite you, she's gonna bite you. Playtime is over. Brian's now recruiting Chris to help sedate an African serval. Down, let's go. Good shot, well done. Well done, Doc. That's pretty good. This feisty cat was born in captivity. Another success story for the Maholo Holo breeding program. So this serval's been hand raised, but she's now reached the age where she can really look after herself. So she's right to be released. Now she's getting a collar put on her, and that way we're going to know where she is. 
key here is just getting the, the actual diameter of this collar right. The fit's got to be spot on. If it's too loose, then these guys will always find a way to, to flick it off over their head. And if it's too tight, it's just going to come into their neck. Doc, you could actually pick her up your turn her face that way. There you are. Well done. Well done. Put it inside. There's it. Close the door. Close the door. Hey, on the tail. The tail's short enough. <laughs> we need to make it shorter. <laughs> the serval will be released later, after she shakes off the sedation. Now there's time for Brian to introduce Chris to some of his favourite residents. Inland? Yeah. Woo -woo, woo -woo, woo -woo. Come on, come on, come on, come on. How do you beat that? Oh, hi. I raised a mommy, and the mommy raised all these babies, and the babies learned to be tame. We've got to protect it. We've got to do something to protect it, you know. And it, Africa's the, it's just dying slowly, slowly, like a cancer. I mean, these beautiful creatures, my, what is their future? Mm. Oh, come on, Chanandi, good girl, good girl. You are, come on, up, 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 come on. That's it. Hello. This is Uncle Chris. Hello. Shenandi is one of the many cheetah Brian has nursed back to health. They brought it to me, run down, mange, full of ticks, parasites, a horrible state. She killed kudu, she killed impala full grown, she's a good hunter. But too tame for release, it's a problem. She's really living proof of Brian's work. I mean, she had two broken legs and now look at her, she, she looks beautiful. She's incredible. No, I love everything. There's no, the only thing I prefer above all is my wife. She's a little flirt. I don't mind that, she's a good looking flirt. To be honest, I think I fell a little bit in love with Shenandi. To be that close to such a mesmerising creature is is awesome, but the reality is there's still work to be done and a wild cat to be released. We get bearings. With the tracking collar, Brian's team will know how the serval's coping on her own. She's accepting that collar though, which is good. Yeah. The great thing about being on this reserve here is they can always keep an eye on her. She'll come back to them if she needs to. If she's doing well, they will never see her again. This is the reason places like Mahalo Hollow really exist. It's about making it better and then releasing it back into the wild. Um, everybody ready? Here yeah, we go. Yeah. Okay. You, you go. jump with us, yeah. so if you guys come with us. All right, Hyde, let's go. At the Mahalo Hollow Rehabilitation Centre, Chris has been asked to join in a mission to microchip a wild rhino. So if he doesn't like what's going on, he's going he's to charge. He, he might. Conservationist oh, Brian Jones, who runs this oasis for endangered animals, knows the risks involved. Uh, if he did come, we'd have to run for our lives and get in the vehicle. And oh, I've had them smash the vehicle a couple of times. They put their horn, fortunately, they put their horn underneath and lift the vehicle up. So it's only the, the back horn that punches a hole. Cody, Cody, we on our way now, Cody. Standing by. Poaching of rhino is something you hear occasionally about in Australia, but in Africa at the moment it is the news story because last year 330 were killed. We're not talking small money for this rhino horn, we're talking about $50,000 a kilo, and in an adult full-size rhino there's about five kilos of horn in each rhino, that's a quarter of a million dollars. Chris and the team are searching for two rhino brothers. Stay right, stay right. Okay. It's the smaller of the two males who still needs a microchip. That's him there. The first problem is getting close enough to the rhino to sedate it with a dart. I'm now at the perfect distance to fire, but the reality hits me. If I get this shot wrong, she's gone. There'll be no second chance. All the while I've been thinking, I'll have some time for this shot. I'll be able to get myself prepared, focused, get the target right. All of a sudden, Hind says, go now. You must go now. And it's on. Before I can enjoy the relief of landing that shot exactly where I wanted it to go, 
he's taken off. And it doesn't look like he's coming back. Been stressed about us being around. Made a run for it. The worry is that the truck hasn't kicked in yet, so yeah, he's gonna drop at some stage, but it might be might be miles away. There's probably some tracks and they're going through this one. You wouldn't think it'd be possible to lose something as big as a rhino, but that's exactly what's happened. But thankfully, what have we got? Heinz tracking skills. The guy's incredible. He's looking at the dirt. He just sees things that I can't even see and goes, not this way, it's gone that way. And all of a sudden, we're getting close to that rhino. You see the big one? There you go. Here's the other one. Go ahead. Hein now alerts Brian to their location. Okay, I'm just uh, southeast of you. Let's just keep our eye open for the other one, eh? The other one ran away towards the mountain, but just keep our eye open, ears and eyes open. He's stumbling around, so it certainly made him a mobile. They stand and sleep like horses, and then at some stage they go down. Chris and Hein are now carefully approaching the sedated rhino. There is still a risk it could turn and charge. To be that close to a rhino, it's one of the most dangerous animals in the world. It's this weird mix of exhilaration and absolute terror, all at the same time. At the Maholo Holo Rehabilitation Reserve, Chris and Hine are cautiously approaching the wild rhino they need to microchip. Oh, just watch out, the other one is just running away here. Yeah? Oh, okay, that's fine. Hey. Going down here. I see there's some blood. There's a hole here. The sedation from a dart gun has now immobilised the massive animal. Just extraordinary. Brian and his team have been given the all clear to bring in the equipment for the dangerous procedure. It really hits home for me when you're here and you see those animals and you look into their little eyes and they're caught up in the middle of this war and they don't really know why they're involved. What they use the horn for is, is honestly a, a bit of a mystery as far as scientists are concerned because it's claimed to have every benefit from being an aphrodisiac to helping arthritis to uh, people even claiming it cures cancer. It's, it sells for up to a million per horn and it's, it's ridiculous money. It costs them their life and then they pay the ultimate price. They're getting ruthless. They're going with GPSs. They're going with international cell phones. I was talking to the rangers in the park when I was there now. And they said, Brian, they have a scout that goes out first. He finds a rhino. He hones him in with the GPS. They shoot it and move out. And in two days, the horn's in China. It's a, it's a one on war. Yeah, he's still nice and pink there. The drilling has started, so the tiny microchip can be placed in the horn. This male's actually very close with the other bigger male and he's just been lurking around the bushes over here, so his constant concern is the fact that he is just very close by. He's not liking what we're doing to his mate, and he could charge any minute. The hole's nice and clear, so that's ready for the chip now. This is a medical procedure with a huge purpose. The idea of getting that microchip into that horn means that it can be tracked anywhere in the world and know exactly where it's come from, and that's the big step in trying to really rule out this horrific crime. 4B7F7Alpha2033. We've microchipped him, we've vaccinated him, we've, we've marked him, we've taken DNA samples, vitamin injections. Really, the whole works is done right here and right now. Now we've done everything, really, it's just up to this injection just to reverse this anesthetic and, and then he, he should hop up and continue on his life a bit safer than he was before. It will be only minutes before the rhino wakes up and the team needs to clear his departure path. He's going to wake him up, get ready to run. If you can climb a tree without thorns, good luck. OK, let's go. Let's go, let's go. Watch out, watch out. Right. Honestly, when I gave that reversal, I thought, I've got a couple of minutes here, we can amble away. Uh-uh. He woke up straight away and meant business. The rhino's still groggy, so he's crashing over rocks and then barges through a tree. 
and then turns around and looks at me. I'm thinking, no, mate, just keep on going the way you're going. But no, he runs straight at me. Yeah, I'd go. Thank you, I'd go. So I do the courageous thing and run fast. I'm sure you're having a great laugh, but when that rhino is running at you, it's very, very scary. Trampled by a rhino. Interesting way to go. Ooh. I've got some oxygen. Chris is good. No, no, he, he's a natural. But he's in the wrong place. He should be in South Africa. That was very special, so thank you. No, well, mission accomplished. Yeah. This is the last day of Chris's African journey. Ah, uh, Ruyatawa. This is where work stops. Now it's time to relax and realise a lifelong dream. Hey, how are you? Oh, good, and yourself? Good, good. I'm Chris. Yeah, I'm Henry. This is Juma Vuyatela, 7,000 hectares of private game reserve where they promise to show you the animals of Africa in their natural environment. This is going to be good. Henry knows this place better than anyone else. He's like a, a wildlife concierge. You just make requests and he, he delivers quickly too. I can see a giraffe. I'd like every single one of the animals all in, in one small area. All of them? Yeah, alphabetical order. OK, because anything is possible down here. Leopard moving through the long grass just through here. I thought we'd see animals in the distance on the horizon and they'd, they'd run away. To see a leopard this close coming towards us, unbelievable. They're very cool. This has absolutely been a boyhood dream to travel to Africa, to not only see the animals, but to be up close to them and make differences to their lives. As a vet, it's, it's the holy grail. I think back on everything that's happened in just a few days, and it's incredible. Meeting Kevin and being allowed into the inner sanctum with those lions was a rare privilege. And then to operate on his best mate, Napoleon. Not done yet. It has to be the most nerve wracking surgery I've ever done. Microchipping a rhino with Brian, a man who loves these animals and this land so much, and meeting so many other wonderful locals with such open hearts on this journey. It's truly been a trip of a lifetime, and I feel absolutely humbled by it. It's not an experience I'll, I'll ever forget.